You're good to go, Johanna. Please mute your mics. Possibly the leader can mute everyone. I don't want to do that necessarily. I understand. <laughs> Please mute your mics.
Please, Mike, your mute your please mute your mics, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Hall, president of the Federally Employed Women Census Women Count Chapter number 465. Welcome to our Department of Commerce Women's History Month special observance event today. We are so excited that you have chosen to join our panel discussion. This year's theme for Women's History Month is Women Providing Healing and promoting hope. Today we'll hear from women across the Department of Commerce and federally employed women to include women of commerce, Seas and Skies, NOAA, Bright Nights, USPTO, BEA, MBDA, and of course, Census Bureau, Census Women Count. But first, we will hear a few remarks from our Census Bureau Director, Robert Santos. Good afternoon and welcome to our celebration of Women's History Month. 
It's great that so many colleagues from around the Department of Commerce could join us for this event, which has been hosted by the Census Women Count Chapter of Federally Employed Women. The national theme for Women's History Month this year is Women Providing Healing, Promoting Hope. It's an opportunity to pay tribute to the constant work of female caregivers and frontline workers during this pandemic, as well as the many ways women around the world have provided healing and hope throughout history. Women's History Month honors the vital but often overlooked roles that women have played in American culture and innovation throughout our nation's history. It calls for us to use the knowledge of the past to better understand modern gender inequality. And with this awareness, we can amplify women's voices and build toward a more equitable future. In this way, we can all work toward fulfilling the goal of federally employed women to end sex and gender discrimination and to encourage diversity and inclusion. Society now benefits greatly from the leadership of women. Over the last 10 years, women have represented over half the presidents of such scientific associations as the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the American Statistical Association, and the American Sociological Association. And of course, there are many female leaders of societal change, such as Rosa Parks, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Eleanor Roosevelt. Yet despite such profound contributions to society, women continue to suffer a gender wage gap, one that has narrowed only slightly over the last 30 years, but persists, even though women are now more likely to have a college education than men. The wage gap for women of color is even more pronounced. Women remain extraordinarily underrepresented in political offices and in the boardroom. And women continue to shoulder an overwhelming majority of the invisible labor in households. Data equity principles enable us to tackle these inequities. At the Census Bureau, we are working to ensure that our data collection can inform equity for women as well as for all marginalized groups. Other agencies throughout the Department of Commerce are undertaking similar initiatives. And today, I'm pleased to recognize and honor the important roles and contributions of women trailblazers in our agency and throughout the department and to commit to supporting your leadership any way I can. Thank you again for joining us in this panel discussion, and I wish you a reflective and insightful Women's History Month. Rachel, you're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Director Santos, for those wonderful remarks. And now I will introduce our moderator, Laverne Bird. Laverne is a member of Federally Employed Women, Census Women Count. She is the Vice President of Public Affairs and Diversity. She's also the Vice Chair for the Diversity Council. Here's Laverne. Thank you, Rachel. And now I would like to introduce you to our esteemed panelists. As I call your name, please tell us a little bit about yourselves. Starting with the Department of Commerce, we have Tiffany Daniel. Tiffany, unmute. Good morning, good morning. Uh, I'm Tiffany Daniel and I am the, uh, I work for the Bureau of Industry and Security, but I am representing few for the department today. So our federally employed women for the department. I'm currently our um, privacy officer as well as our CUI program manager. And it has been a wonderful time this year as we are starting to transition but as well as an honor to be asked to speak on behalf of the department today. So I thank you all so much, so much. Thank you. Well, thank you and welcome. Uh, next we have from BEA, Janine Aversa. 
Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. I want to first say that I was so inspired and uplifted by all the wonderful quotes that I saw on the screen, and thank you so much for including me in today's event. Uh, I handle all communications. I'm chief of communications at BEA, and that's all internal communications as well external. So that's the media, Congress, all of our stakeholders, um, not only in the United States, but around the world. And I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you and welcome. Uh, now from Census, Judy Belton. Good afternoon and thank you so much for having me. Again, I'm Judy Belton. I'm the Assistant Division Chief for Special Enumerations um, in the Decennial Census Management Division. So as you know, we just finished up 2020 census, but most of you don't know, we're getting ready for 2030. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're busy, always busy. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, next, we have Jackie D. Wright Bonilla from USPTO. Jackie, unmute. Hi. Um, great. Thank you. Um, it is so wonderful to be here. I'm going to echo what everybody else said on the presentations. And thank you to FEW and the women at Census that set this up. This really is a, a, a wonderful cap off to Women's History Month, and it's just an incredible honor to be here. Um, my name is Jackie Bonilla, and I am at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I am at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. Um, I am Deputy Chief Administrative Patent Judge there, um, and we handle cases on behalf of the office that have been appealed uh, from examiner's decisions or challenges to issued patents. Um, and again, thank you so much for being here. It's wonderful, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Jackie, and welcome. Uh, and from NOAA. Irene Parker. Irene. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Irene Parker. I actually am in the satellite organization of NOAA. I'm the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Systems, which basically means I am responsible for all of the programs for the satellite launches for all the weather satellites. And we recently launched um, Ghost T, our weather satellite, um, this March. Um, during Women's Month. So that was really great. So March 1st, we had a successful launch and I'm looking forward to talking to you all. Thank you. Well, thank you and welcome everyone. Now, let's get started with our questions. So question number one, what if any barriers in your quest for career growth have you experienced and how did you overcome them? And let's start with Irene. Okay, so being a woman in the STEM field, um, the academic discipline puts me in the minority to start with. Um, so it's already a, a very limited field and being a female, it's even smaller and being a woman of color, it makes it even smaller. Uh, women only make up 29% of the STEM workforce and only 3% of the STEM industry CEOs. Um, there have been many challenges uh, in working in a male dominated field. Um, for me, a key to overcoming these challenges is to be the best at what you do. And I have to stress that you have to be the best at what you do, which means being the most knowledgeable, being the most informed. Um, that gives people the opportunity to respect you. You earn their respect. They come to you for information and direction. And it's very key uh, to be on top of um, your area in your field. Uh, when we break down these barriers by showing our competence and being decisive and being confident in our abilities, it really uh, is impactful. Um, it shows what we are capable of doing and it garners the respect that we should have always been getting, but we will be able to get and maintain. Well, thank you. That's excellent, um, Irene. Uh, Jackie, did you have anything to add? Um, I was thinking about this and I thought I would share something that was sort of a, a barrier for me. Um, there have been times when I've taken what I thought were pretty big risks professionally um, and whatever I was doing was so new that I wasn't sure if I was good at it. I wasn't sure if I was making the right choice um, and one big ex and wondered if I should just quit what I was doing and go back to the old thing. Um, and one big example for me was actually attending law school itself. Um, because I had gone, um, I had been a scientist, I was a biochemistry major undergrad, I went to and got my PhD in pharmacology, and I decided in my last year of graduate work that I wanted to become a lawyer, I cold called patent attorneys I learned about, and I was very excited about it. Um, but this, at the time, when I was in grad school, was a really weird thing to do. 
um, my grad school faculty, my dissertation committee, including the chair of my department, they all tried to talk me out of it. And they thought I was leaving science and they expressed honestly just outright disappointment in my choice. Um, and everybody thought it was weird and everybody made me feel like they thought the graduate program had failed me, that maybe I thought I didn't have what it takes to be a scientist. And so a bunch of uh, mentors and faculty, they, they tried to encourage me and talk me out of it, which was nice to hear that they thought I could make it in science, but it made the decision to go to law school for me, honestly, a lot scarier. And I really felt like I was on my own. And I felt like if I failed there, it would be this whole, I told you so, or you know, it's, that's on you for making a dumb decision. Um, and then once I got to law school itself, to be honest with you, I, I struggled a little bit. Um, I knew how to work hard as a scientist and as a grad student, but law school, especially with its focus on writing, which is a different type of writing than I was used to, was, was different. And so it, honestly, it wasn't a smooth transition for me, but I just, I worked hard, but it wasn't very easy. Um, so, so basically what happened is, you know, I started wondering if I had made a mistake. Um, and look, fortunately for me, I was able to be a law, a summer associate at a law firm, and it turned out I loved it at the law firm. Um, and so I knew the law was for me. So I just gutted it out. Um, and what I would share with you now is what I really underestimated at the time, especially for somebody who was all science all the time, was that there was an adjustment period and that I would get there. Um, and that this plowing through that fear of failure was really pivotal to, for me. Um, I could have easily gotten my own way and been my own barrier and just gave up and decided I wasn't going to do it. But I am so grateful that I stuck it out because it was just such a huge life lesson for me about if you really want something and you know in your gut that that's the right thing for you, you just keep on, just keep on. And, and you know, even if you think you might fail spectacularly, even if you, in fact, fail along the way, um, but taking, you know, the good risks and don't letting, you know, initial failures stop you. Uh, you know, give it the time you need and just cut yourself a break if you don't have it all figured out immediately. Just keep on keeping on. I just, I cannot underestimate how much that has been pivotal in my own success. It's just not quitting when I felt like maybe I should. Right. So persistence is key. Um, anybody else? Okay. Second question. Do you have a network? How did you find it? And how do you use it? And then um, we'll follow up with um, who have been your allies and how have they supported you on your path to success. We'll lump those two together. So let's start with uh, Tiffany. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I do have a network and I will say that they kind of found me as I started uh, moving up the career chain. Uh, not so much maybe in commerce, but I'm a community leader and an activist and an advocate. So I found myself surrounded by many powerful women in leadership. And uh, what I like is I found that they're trailblazers. So with being surrounded by trailblazers, they don't mind reaching back and they don't mind sharing because their their self-esteem or their, their level is where they don't mind or don't feel as though you're going to take anything from them. So therefore, they're very open and they're always asking you if you need anything. So um, as Jacqueline shared earlier, it's like as I, I changed my uh, career field or and I've also changed my my path for education. So I've decided instead of pursuing a doctoral degree in IT, I switched to theology. So I'm now <laughs> I am now a chaplain and a pastor, but I'm also moving forward to <laughs> Christian education. So big change and a lot of things that I do in the community. So when I move to the second question, that is with the allies, I can say that both men and women at um, at one time, I said my circle consisted of all women, but now it's gravitating or opening up more to men, men that I've served with, but men that I've also worked with. And I just, I find it just so, um, so gratifying to know that people will open up to you. And, and um, um, when I was in uniform, I'm a veteran, I, I felt like people were very close and they did not want to share, but outside in the community and in the workplace and the various organizations that I'm affiliated with, I find just the opposite. 
And it's it's just been awesome. It's been great with my growth and professionalism as well as um, in the workplace. So thank you all so much. Oh, thank you. Excellent. Uh, Tiffany, did you want to add to that? Oh, wait a minute. You are Tiffany. Sorry. Irene, I mean, <laughs> Irene. Yes, yeah, so I will say I've been very lucky in my career um, having network and mentors helping me throughout the way. I started out actually in the private sector and my network basically came from my career counselor at Accenture. I'll always remember him. His name is Mike Casey. He took me under his wing. Um, I knew nothing about the field I was going into. I majored in math and they put me on an IT project and he he was just so open and transparent and he helped me build my network he basically took me under his wing and his network became my network he introduced me to so many different people um he it really had me really believe in myself and so my network grew out of that um then i switched over to the federal government and I will say it was a little bit more challenging in the federal government to grow my network, especially in, in the STEM area. Uh, many folks uh, were, when I came into the federal government, I came in at a senior level. So that was a little bit more challenging because most of the folks were kind of, you know, had come in at a junior level and they had grown in the federal government and therefore their network was really strong. What I lucked out was I found an amazing mentor again in the federal government. His name is Mark Paese. Um, and he uh, took me under his wing and he would say that like he had two daughters and a wife and he would say that he, you know, he grew up in a sorority house, basically surrounded by women and wanted to empower them. And he took me under his wing and he introduced me to so many different people uh, across NOAA. And today I'm his counterpart. I'm the DA on the other side. So he's the DA of operations and I'm now the DA of systems. So I would just say that I, it's it's amazing to see the generosity that people have. You you just have to find that connection, and when you do, your network will blossom. Um, and that's what I have to reiterate. It, you will be able to find that, and it will blossom, and it will help you not just in your career, but in your work life balance. You'll find that, and I hope you all do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next, we have um, some, some some women in leadership have felt the need to shrink themselves to a point where they are not their authentic selves to make others feel comfortable. What can what advice can you offer those with this experience, Jackie? Sure, this, I think this is a great question because I have to tell you, I have personally struggled with this one and I still struggle with it now. I ask my questions, you know, am I too aggressive? Do I talk too much? Um, you know, do I look like I'm being too aggressive or too ambitious by even trying to talk in a room where there's a bunch of important people or applying for a promotion even? Um, you know, will colleagues be mad at me if I, if I, or think less of me if I try or if I get it? Um, and, and I have to tell you, something that has sort of inspired me is I, I've thought about just. Uh oh. Jackie, you went on mute. Unmute yourself. Jackie? Unmute. You're muted, Jackie. You yes. My phone went. Okay. All right. I think I'm no longer muted. Sorry about that. Phone okay. phone balance function. Um, but I was just talking about Justice O'Connor because that's somebody I've thought about under this sort of topic. And there's a great uh, biography about her that was written by Joan uh, Buskapuk. Um, and her book really conveys how Justice O'Connor, she seemed to always picture, give this picture of complete elegance and grace while she quietly did all this amazing work and positioned herself to be, you know, positioned for bigger and better things. She seemed to strike this perfect balance of looking like an excellent wife and a mother and a hostess and never being ruffled, uh, by, you know, or by being, a, you know, she never came across as a bull in a china shop but when her tone and her action but still being respected for the work she did. And I have to tell you, I, um, I've often wonder if I have it, what it takes to pull off things the way that she did, to be this elegant swan who quietly and effectively gets everything done without bothering anybody, right? Um, 
And I know I personally oscillated between thinking that I need to tone myself down when I talk, practice my listening and elegance in speech. On the other hand, I also realized for myself and others that I've watched that the fact that I do speak up and frankly risk sometimes looking too outspoken is probably a big part of the reason why I'm in the room where important decisions are being made and why I have the position I have today. So the bottom line is for better, or for worse, I actually have a hard time not being my authentic self and it hasn't gotten me fired yet. So that's good news. <laughs> um, but when I, when I think about my authentic self though, I do realize that my true self is not always its best if I can't manage things like stress and getting enough sleep. Um, and so for me, self-care is really, really important to make sure that I can be my authentic self, which is my best self. So I don't look like, you know, I'm hanging by a thread and wigging out on people, you know, before I start talking. Um, so, so for me, that, that would be my advice is be your authentic self, but constantly make sure that you're, you know, listening to constructive advice when it comes to, to make you better. You are always learning, but make sure that you take care of yourself because you can't really be your best self if you're not taking care of yourself. So, you know, take that vacation, leave early from work when you can, uh, take those health, day, mental health days. I mean, cause it really will help you be your most best authentic self. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Janine, did you have something to add? Yes, I do. You know, I saw this question and I, it really resonated with me. And I have to say that I look back and I, have definitely had instances where I self-edited and I have to say it is exhausting <laughs> and my advice stop right now you know I think there's this saying and, and it's be yourself nobody can do it better yes. and I just like taking a pause there because it's so true you know use your uniquely you talent and experience and knowledge and skills and all those things that you have to bring about good, you know, within your organization, with your colleagues, in the, in the larger community we operate in. I just think that it's so important um, to, to do that. And of course, I want to say, you know, yes, you have to be, you know, focused if it's in the work situation. You want to be focused on your goals and your mission and, and results. You know, I'm not suggesting uh, that we shouldn't. That's our North Star. And we're going to follow that. But I I definitely struggled, you know, with the self-editing. And I don't want to come off as some sort of Pollyanna. But I found that when I'm my, you know, true authentic self, that it opens me up to, like, new connections. And people talked about this already. And just you know, open my mind up too to like just being open to different situations. And at the end of the day, I felt better about myself. Excellent. So does anybody else have anything to add before I move on? Yes, um, I do. Um, so I agree, you know, with everything, you know, Jackie said and Janine, and I thought a lot about this question as well. And so my first response is knowing when can be your authentic self, I think, sometimes. And I don't know if I'm saying that, and maybe my answer is a little different because I am a woman, but I'm also a woman of color, and sometimes we get stereotyped. So I think that knowing when to be your authentic self, because sometimes your authentic self may not work in certain situations. So, you know, I would just add that. You know, just be cognizant, read in the room. You know, is it... You may, your authentic self may be, you know, to talk over people, you know, that's not what you should be doing, you know, in all circumstances. And so knowing the room and just being aware of when that real Judy or that real Jackie or that real somebody else needs to come, it doesn't need to present itself in all situations. Thank you. That's, that's an excellent point. And then someone else mentioned tone. Yeah, you know, tone is very important as well. I think we all can work on that. I know I definitely can. Uh, thank you, guys, ladies. Uh, next, do you have boundaries at work? What are they and how did you establish them? Irene? 
Yes, I have boundaries at work. I've had to, uh, otherwise, especially in the pandemic, otherwise the work never ends. It just it just stays with you all the time. Um, with your iPhone and your email, you have to set up boundaries. Uh, one of the things that I've had to do is literally use technology to help me set up those boundaries. So I actually use the um, do not disturb feature after a certain hour on my phone. So I'm not getting text messages or emails um, because if I see my phone light up, I, I, I go and I read that email and I respond to that text. So I have had to set up boundaries there. Um, I've also had to set up boundaries about wanting to do more, um, just do more. Uh, there are times where I had a very challenging time saying no. Um, and I had to set up boundaries where I would always volunteer. I would always take that extra step, maybe sometimes an extra 100 steps. <laughs> um, and I had to learn to pause and really think about, you know, am I overstepping? Am I taking too much on? Um, you have to ask those questions. Only you know uh, of that. And you need to kind of self-reflect on that. Um, it takes time and the boundaries change. So I'm not saying I'm rigid in my boundaries. They, they change over time. Sometimes they change during the week. Um, so you have to be a little bit flexible, but you need to know what your priorities are and, and focus on that and, and create your own regimen associated with that. I think people believe that if you put up boundaries, you're not going to be successful in your career. That is so not true. Um, people are much more respectful and mindful of your time when you set up boundaries um, that it will actually help you, um, I think, in your career path uh, just by even just being more efficient with your time because you've set up boundaries. Um, but I think it's a challenging thing to do, but it's an appropriate step to do and um, start small or even start big, but stick to it um, is the key thing. Um, and so that, those are my thoughts associated with that. Well, thank you so much. Um, Janine, did you have anything to add? Well, I read, I read summed it up so well. I'll just add that uh, the pandemic actually taught me to do a better job of setting up the boundaries because I, I realized, oh, you know, I can just, uh, you know, my computer's plugged in and I'll just get on and I'll do this. And it was like, there was not a beginning and end to my work days. I was working on the weekends and things like that. And I realized, oh, you know, I made a conscious effort not to um, ask uh, folks that I work with. I wasn't sending them things when the off hours or on the weekends. I was like, I was putting this on myself. So I, I realized, you know, even though some things can be convenient, I need to set up those boundaries and 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 have the beginning and the end. And as Irene said, there there has to be that flexibility because you know things change, developments happen, and and. You know, that's that's really important. Excellent. Thanks. OK, ladies, um, if you have anything to add, just jump in. And if I forget or if, you know, you have a burning desire to answer a question, you know, please feel free. But for now, I'm going to move on. Um, let's see. Life changes us all. Who are you today versus who you were at the onset of your career? What changed and enhanced you along this journey? Joanne? Thank you, Laverne, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joanne Hill. I serve as chief of the Office of Business Development at the Minority Business Development Agency. Um, I didn't get to introduce myself <laughs> at the beginning, but um, I'm also the co-chair of the department's okay. Equity Council uh, Underserved Businesses and Communities. And so all things equity, if you will, uh, I'm a part of that portfolio as well. Um, but what what has uh, life does change us and some of the most significant changes that I've experienced have included uh, the loss of a parent. Uh, uh, things that just life throw at us where we have to adjust and adapt our lives and our careers. Um, but when I think about and look at where I started my career with the federal government some 22 years ago. And where I was then as a junior level business development specialist and where I've evolved to today in the role that I play at headquarters, I made a conscious decision 
that I was going to better myself by number one. Uh, had constant heard about you need to get a mentor. You need to find a mentor to help be your sponsor to help chart you along your path uh, along this journey. I, I had mentors from the time that I joined the agency up until today. Some of them are not members of MBDA, but they work with other organizations. Um, and that has been very critical for me. The other intentional decision that I made was to continue my education. OK, after I started my career, I waited a little while and then um, I had a mentor who said to me, you know, Joanne, you need to go back and you need to pursue your MBA. And I did it and I worked full time and I went to school full time. And boy, was that a sacrifice. <laughs> um, but uh, I did exceptionally well. Um, it spared me very well. And the little shy person that I was from a little small town out in, in South Carolina to where I am today when I go back, you know, as you can imagine, it's like, oh, Joanne, so. <laughs> but um, it's really gratifying and it's um, it set me up to be a role model for other young ladies that are coming along now who um, aspire and dream and I can provide them with hope you know, as a part of our theme sure. today, hope, and some yeah. of those that have also experienced some of what I have in the healing process along the way for losses or, or other challenges that they might have experienced throughout their lives and career journey. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, I didn't introduce you. I didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself earlier. <laughs> no, it's OK. <laughs> it's okay. Do you want to give, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself now briefly? Uh, Jacqueline, the other Jacqueline is nodding, so absolutely. <laughs> um, in my role at MBDA, I have oversight of our national network of business centers, programs, and initiatives. We have a footprint of right at around 75 um, footprints. Um, MBDA was the, the little sister of the department, uh, 13 bureaus. We were probably one of the smallest agencies. But I'm very um, happy and gratified to share that we are now a permanent agency. Uh, we received okay. codification back in November of 2021 under the Minority Business Development Act. Yay. Yes. <laughs> and um, that's really critical for us as a nation. Um, in our competitiveness, um, the census, you know this, with this demographic shift that's going on, we hear about that um, in our competitiveness as a nation and how we leverage uh, the economic benefit of these firms and that they're going to bring to us as a, they continue to bring to us as a nation in our competitiveness in this global economy. And so um, it is um, that's a part of what I do have oversight of the programs that help push promote um, minority business enterprise growth and expansion both domestically and internationally. Excellent. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> Um, Tiffany, did you want to add to that question? Did, did I need to read it again? Tiffany? Well, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So, should I read it again? Changes. Okay. No, no. Change. What changes? Uh, yeah. Changes for me. Uh, one was a transition again, as I said, from coming from the military and then just getting adapted to being a, a federal employee. I felt like I was a fish out of water for a long time. This the Department of Commerce is not a DOD entity and it took some getting used to. <laughs> but not only that, the, the entire lifestyle, I mean, just transitioning and then um, not moving into a leadership position when I transitioned also. So it took a lot of getting used to and then um, setting boundaries as, as Irene, uh, Irene shared so eloquently earlier. It's um, working from home. You, I just had to transition to setting boundaries even with the family, it's like, you can't talk to me right now. Uh, you can't just walk in the room and have a conversation and no, I'm, you know, just different things. But um, for the career, for my career with the Bureau of Industry and Security, I am not even working in the in, in this section or an organization to where I was working with my last duty station at the Pentagon. I was uh, um, a federal... <laughs> a um a foreign disclosure officer and now i'm in 
administration as a privacy officer, but just it's a total, total different career field. But I will tell you this, I was about to deploy again. I had uh, done my interview like six months prior. And when they called me and said, are you still interested? Which choice do you think I made? <laughs> right? It's like my family was looking at me like, look, you've been deployed a couple of times now. Uh, you have your 20 years. We think that you need to start uh, thinking about us. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a major transition, if I have to say so. So, yes, thank you all so much. <laughs> OK, well, well, thank you. Um, next, there is a movement promoting self-care and wellness. What is your best recipe for wearing all the hats you wear and finding balance in it all? Joanne, it's you again. Well, thank you. Yes, balance. Um, balance is most critical. Um, for, for my colleagues that are joining today, they know that I am, I, I work a lot, but I have to tell you that I do take time to engage and involve with healthy social capital. That's really, really important. Um, and, and whether it be with colleagues or with my nonprofit uh, work that I do uh, with regard to events and activities that I participate in, primarily in giving back, as you saw as a part of my quote, um, uh, the gratitude that I experience with regard to reaching back and giving back. Um, that is a part of the balance for me. I also encourage uh, folk, uh, whenever the weather is beautiful, which I hope to be soon, you know, I will walk home from work. And uh, you might have seen me along my journey <laughs> walking, uh, walking home, uh, but exercise, um, social capital, remembering your faith. And, and, and oftentimes when I'm feeling like, you know, I need a little more balance, you know, I might just pick up, you know, and read a, a daily affirmation, a positive affirmation, you know, uh, to give myself that balance so that I remember it's not all about you know, this deadline that I've got to meet, you know, and if I don't get it done, oh, things are going to fall apart, uh, if you <laughs> if you will. But balance is the key. That's really what keeps you is extremely healthy and I highly encourage it. Right. OK. Um, anybody else want to answer that? I would just say I, I thought about this, too, and a lot of my answers were very similar to Johan. Um, and and I, I did one of the things I put on there was exercise, like I, with everything else as crazy as it gets. And I mean, and by exercise, I mean, literally like a walk in the park, like anything you can fit in. I just for me personally, that is so critical to my physical and mental health. It's, it's not a vanity thing. It's literally like to make sure I don't lose my mind. Um, just the, so yeah, I, I do these YouTube exercise videos, which are great if you don't have any time, because then you can just do it and you don't have to go to the gym. You don't spend any time. So that, that's what works for me. Um, and besides those things, I, I always think about but haven't pulled off doing things like yoga and meditation and just being outside in nature, which I think Joanne mentioned, you know, quietly without any music blaring, which I normally love to have. Uh, but just all that self-care stuff, I think that's, you know, fitting that in and making that a priority, I think are just things that force me to quiet my mind and shut it all off. Um, I think I, I'm still working on it. I haven't pulled it off completely, but, it, but I do think it is really critical. Excellent. OK, in terms of your career path, what lessons learned can you offer to aspiring professionals coming behind you? Judy? Yeah, thank you. I think it's really important to move around, work in different places. It's worked for me. Um, there are times where I chose to move on my own and I there are times where I feel like people move me, <laughs> but it all worked out at the mm -hmm. end of the day. Don't be afraid to work in different areas. Uh, I love census. Census allows the opportunities for you to work on a various surveys um, where you can bring along the skills that you've acquired and earn, you know, get some new skill sets. Um, and I think it's important because it builds upon each other and it's also I think the opportunity to learn the different leadership styles 
-hmm. we have a, you know, we get comfortable sometimes and we get that boss that we just love and we just want to be with forever. Then that boss leaves and then you have to deal with somebody else. So and I think it diversifies you, not only your skill sets, but dealing with people, working with people, learning how, you know, to deal with difficult people. And I think you get all of that when you're moving around. And, um, you know, I think that for me, it's helped me a lot to have worked in different branches, different directorates and things like that. And, you know, it helps you build that network that I, you know, I heard some of you talk about earlier, you know, where you can somebody and say, hey, you know, can you help me out with this or that? But I would just tell young people, come in look around, take advantage of the opportunities um, within your agency, and just learn, learn as much as you can. So Judy, what do you think about lateral moves? I think laterals are fine. You know, I did a, I did a few lateral moves, and sometimes people look at it as, oh, you know, you know, what are people going to think about? It's not a promotion. You know, lateral moves are good. Sometimes the lateral moves are necessary to be able to move to the next level. Actually, the lateral moves that I took allowed me to go to the next level each time. So oh. don't be afraid and don't, yeah, and don't be afraid and don't think that you're hurting your current supervisor's feelings or anything like that. Because I think if you have good leadership, they're going to support and they know that you need to move around to be able to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I, I'd like to just jump in and build off of what Judy said. This is Janine. You know, uh, do your best no matter what the task is and, and keep learning and be generous with others. I think the learning is so important. Um, when I look back on my uh, career, I realize now, and I didn't then at the time, that a lot of the, the mundane tasks where I thought that they were mundane or unglamorous kinds of, of things that I had to do, all of these things um, actually over time uh, were preparing me to take on the bigger high impact projects and and high and maybe you know even more high pressure projects. And I, if you don't mind, I just I love this quote from Steve Jobs, and I just want to share it really quickly sure. um, with you. He, he, uh, he's the founder of Apple, and he was talking to graduates um, at the commencement speech. And he said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, Destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach has never let me down, and it has made the difference in my life. I just love that, and I think that um, it's spot on. Well, thank you Thanks. for sharing. Thank you. Okay. Um, what, if anything, would you like your leadership legacy to be? Joanne and then Judy. Thank you, Laverne. Sure. I would I would like for my leadership to be um, my leadership legacy to be centered on um, the fact that uh, folk knew that I cared. Um, I gave back. Um, I did not put myself first. Um, I was always looking to help pull up the next generation behind me, and. I also um, want to be of service to all mankind. Um, I intentionally take the time when we talk about balance, uh, when we have special holidays where I might go and volunteer uh, to either be a part of, of, of putting together things that we give to those less fortunate, right? Um, but also uh, giving back to support scholarships and giving back to uh, those that are less fortunate, if you will. Um, and 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 in my career, um, my goal is to ensure that the next generation of leaders are bred 
and that they have access to the resources that helped me. Um, the point that the, um, uh, I think it was uh, Janine or, or Judy mentioning about uh, professional development, right? Um, that's very critical, very critical to career growth. And anytime that there is the opportunity to push <laughs> for the training budget, the thing that oftentimes, you know, if we've got to make sacrifices, might sometimes, you know, be one of those things that we have to, um, you know, consider a uh, cut, but, but making certain that, you know, my legacy is centered on reaching back, giving back, and being of service to all mankind. That's what I would like my legacy to be anchored on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. J Judy? She said it. She said it all. I had nothing to add. You know, it's, it's, you know, I think that um, I didn't put myself above anyone. You know, I didn't. I don't mind sitting in the back seat and letting others drive. I think once you get to a certain level, that's how you help people to grow. You know, you're not the one you have to be out talking and you know let people drive sometimes. And that I had an open door policy. I think sometimes the younger, the journeymen, the younger staff, they like to put leaders in a bucket. You know, they're bigger, they're giants. I did that too, you know, and so I don't want people to look at me that way, you know, and I try to be that way with my staff. And sometimes I could tell they're a little timid when they want to talk to me. And I was like, no, don't be that way. I'm a person, I'm human, just like you are, you know, we give each other mutual respect, but that I let them be themselves. I let them lead if they wanted to lead. I let them follow if they wanted to follow, but I gave that encouragement. And so I would want that to be my legacy, that I gave the opportunity. Excellent. Excellent. If you wanted it. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, many believe that being a woman makes you a superhero. What is your superpower, Janine? Oh boy, I thought this was a really tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say curiosity. I am a uh, curious person and, and it's just because I, I like to learn more. I like to find out more about things. Um, that, you know, not a curiosity alpha gotcha or something like that. And uh, I think that's it. I like it. I like it. I think it's great. You know, always learning, always being curious. Fantastic. Um, anybody else? Okay. Uh, what do you believe the next decade of work will look like for women in the workplace and why? Janine, that's you again. Oh boy, this was a tough one. I'm just going to say that I'm an optimist at heart. So uh, I'll preface it with that. Um, I'm hoping that we'll see more women leaders across the board in their C-suites and, and, and everywhere in all different kinds of fields. I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll see more caregiving options, that we'll see more flexibilities in where we work, when we work, and how we work. So we'll see. All right. Anyone else? I thought I would add something here. Um, one thing that I see, and I'm thinking about women in IP, whether it's women inventors or um, people who work in positions of leadership in IP, whether it be law firms or at the USPTO, um, I think what a lot of people recognize today is that there's actually a pipeline problem. So a lot of times we end up hiring from the applicant pool that we have that are qualified that actually apply in the first place. And once you start sort of moving up the upper echelon, you start seeing fewer and fewer women, fewer and fewer, you know, diverse people, people of color, and that's a pipeline issue. And so I think we really need to start a lot earlier. We need to start in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, and really let, you know, show people who we are and what we do and the places they can go. And I think that there's a greater awareness of that now than there has been in prior years. And so I think that if we as women, and, and it, frankly, everybody, we sort of realize that and work toward it, um, I really do expect in the future, you know, in, in, in the next decade that we will see 
the demographics in, you know, positions of leadership and, and being inventors and things like that will start to really reflect who we are as a nation. Um, because the people are there, the talent is there, the passion is there. It's just making sure people know they can get there and have the support that they need and that they, they see others doing it so they realize it's not so weird, um, you know, not feel alone doing it. So I, I, I am very optimistic about the future, um, particularly because I think people are paying attention to the pipeline issue. Excellent. And I think that's really important. And I think that all of us need to be looking at the pipeline and seeing where we can advance someone, you know, bring them along with us, you know, or, or mentor them or either sponsor them. I think it's very important um, because that is a major issue that we have current currently. Thank you for that. OK. Uh, oh, anybody else? OK. As a manager or leader, how do you support or assist in a positive manner? Judy and then Janine. I think um, just being supportive. Um, that's all, you know, just, you know, just being very supportive. It's not people are people. Just be supportive of the situation. OK. Can you give an example? Um, you know, just, you know, like I talked about earlier, just, you know, being yourself and being approachable. Um, and it allows people, you know, to um, be there, be themselves. And, you know, that's how you support them. OK. Janine? Yeah, just to build on what Judy uh, said, I think being being available and present for folks, um, you know, the accessibility factor and, and, and being a good listener. Um, sometimes people, uh, you know, you, you need, we need to listen and speak less, listen more uh, so that we can hear what people really need and then, um, and then do what we can. Sometimes it might be that uh, we need to point them to, you know, I, and I've done this, uh, people need some resources like the employee assistance program. So you, you try to like be supportive and, and, and point people to resources that they need. I personally, in, in terms of a, a, a leadership style, believe in playing to people's strengths versus their weaknesses. And, and I think, you know, looking for that and helping people develop and get the training they need and to maintain, I think, being the, the, being the change that you want to be, being the role model so that others can, can you know, see you. And, it, and it's just being generous and um, patient <laughs> and watching our tone, not speaking over others, all of these things, um, mentoring when we can. I, I don't have a secret sauce, but uh, I would say it begins with caring. Oh, excellent. I love that. Can I just add on? on yes, that? please. I would say being a leader and showing support also means truly honoring your commitment to the folks you're supporting. So I have seen over time that people say supportive statements, but they don't follow through as a leader on the actions. And right. as a leader, I like to honor my commitments. And I think that's how you show true leadership and show uh, show true support and that may be telling people something that they don't want to hear that's supportive also it doesn't always have to be uh you know uh you know completely being their sounding board on that aspect but i really do think being a supportive leader means honoring your word and and following through because if you don't follow through it's just lip service. You're you're not an excellent leader. You're you're just you're you're playing a role, but you're not following through. So I think it's just really important. Honor your word. Integrity is everything. Exactly. I, I love that. I love it. Yes. Yes, I love it. Fantastic. Um, okay. As a manager or leader, how supportive are you with staff who are grieving the loss of a loved one? Uh, especially during this time of COVID where people are losing multiple uh, loved ones. And, you know, that's a difficult time. So how are you supportive during this time, Janine? 
books? Uh, I think I just mentioned it, but I'll, I'll repeat that certainly when it's somebody is like lost love, when we have had that, um, uh, you know, on my staff and in my agency, it's we've lost our coworkers. It's been unbelievably hard. Yes. Uh, again, it's, it's, you know, when there's like a shock like that, I, I think it's important that that uh, people know that they can. That your office is open, your virtual office is open, that people can share if they need to. And again, pointing folks to the resources that we need. Commerce has a great employee assistance program, and um, for grieving and and loss, it it has been really a godsend. Excellent. Okay. I would just add one thing to that. Yes. Um, yes. So I've had some friends who have had like parents and things like that. And it's interesting because different people have different ways that they want to deal with it. And sometimes people need the support. They need the time off. But I've had people say to me, work is the only thing that is keeping me hanging on. I actually need to work right now. Um, and so just being and, and what I what I've done in that situation is say, I totally get it. I probably would be the same way. But you just tell me on the drop of a dime if you need to stop working. So I'm just going to assume you're there, but you tell me and you have carte blanche to stop if you need to. Uh, you do whatever you, you take the time you need, you get the support you need. And if work helps for you, then by all means, let's do that. Um, so that that was sort of interesting to me to learn that sometimes actually working helps um, when people are going through something like this. Yes. It it's a distraction. Um, anyone yeah. else? And it, uh, it's Janine again. I just, mm -hmm. Jackie hit such a good point. Um, everyone grieves differently. And so we have to respect that and do what we can within their, you know, what would be best for them, what they want. Okay. Um, for those with children, how do you navigate taking time off but still have career opportunities for growth? Would you shorten your maternity leave? so you wouldn't fall behind? How do you manage work-life balance as it pertains to having children and a career? Uh, Irene and then Jackie. Uh, let's see, when I had, I have one daughter, uh, she's about to turn 16 in a couple months. Uh, when I had her, um, everything changed. I was working in the private sector. My husband used to call me the weekend wife because I was always traveling and I didn't want to be a weekend mom. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I decided um, that I thought I could do it all. So I actually went back to work in like four weeks, even though I had six weeks of maternity. And that was the worst thing I think I ever did. Like it wasn't good for my family. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't good for my my work. Like um, you when you have a child. I think we think we're all superheroes and we can do everything. You're going to need to take a step back. I'm just being honest from my perspective. You got to take a step back. It's not feasible to do it all. Um, but what is feasible is for you to self be self aware and try to figure things out. Um, I did put my career on pause after I had my daughter um, and I don't regret it at all. Um, not one bit. Um, and even though I put my career on pause when I mean, like not going up, like, um, to other higher levels that, you know, you would see others who did not have children were able to pursue. Um, I'm, I'm a deputy assistant administrator right now. So it, you can take a pause and you can get back on a career path. Um, I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, I decided to get back on this career path after. Um, my daughter was in middle school, so in her elementary years, I chose to take a more of a, a, a pause on my career. But once she was in middle school, I felt like I could balance it a lot better. Um, and so I went and I pursued uh, trying to, uh, you know, get my promotions, et cetera. And, it, and maybe I was lucky. Um, it goes back to my network that I talked about in the prior question. Um, Mike Casey, Mark Paese, um, you know, they all had children also, so they were very supportive of that. So I think there's a little bit of luck to be able to come back from having a kid and trying to get back into that uh, career ladder, uh, but it's doable. And I still think I have a really great relationship with my daughter. Um, I actually overheard her during the pandemic telling her friends that like she actually likes me. So I feel like I've done something good <laughs> like on that, right? Like, uh, um, so 
um, it's challenging, but it was what I decided to do. It might not be what you decide to do, but it's OK. Um, but I got to say, you cannot have it all, all at the same time it, from my perspective. It, something has to give, and it's OK what you choose to give. Jackie, thank you. I, uh, so I have two kids. I have a daughter who's now 16 and a son who's 13. And I had both of my kids while I was still at the law firm. And I took 12 weeks paid maternity leave. That's what they gave us at the time. And I would not ever consider taking less than that. <laughs> There's no way. It would have been way too hard to do it with less than that. And I was extremely fortunate because my husband at the time, um, he was working in the Department of Justice, and he actually took a month off after me. Um, so that was really great. So we didn't have to worry about any kind of daycare um, until um, our kids were four months old. Um, I will say that um, after that first year after the kids were born was 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 a little rough and it was frankly a, a blur. It was a manageable blur, but it was a blur, you know, with all the stuff I was doing um, at the time. Um, at the firm, I ended up, I didn't end up taking time off. I ended up reducing down to an 80% time schedule. Uh, but at a firm, that still meant working about 40 to 50 hours a week. Um, so it was, um, it was, but, and I have to say one thing that is great about working for the federal government is that full time is 40 hours a week. And they say, you, you can work 40 hours a week and that's it. And I, that's a real gift. Um, but I have to say, I know that different people have different things. I have lots of friends who have done what Irene has done. Um, for me, it worked best to, to stay in the workforce, even if it was part time. And I'm really glad that I gutted it out. I think, um, you know, with every passing month as the kid gets older, it gets a little bit easier. Um, and, and, and I think staying in the workforce, if you, there are people who I've talked to about it. And, and again, you know, you have to do what's best for your family. But um, if you can stay at work, even part time, um, at, at any level you can handle, I think it makes it much easier to ramp back up. I think if you sort of keep your toe in it, you can go back to full time, you know, pretty almost instantaneously. And that's not to say you can't do it after taking some years off. I mean, some of a, a very good friend of mine is an APJ here, and she took off more than 10 years um, out of the law firm and came back here as an, an APJ and is, is one of our very best. So there's no doubt you can come back. It's just a little, it just takes a little bit more inertia. Um, I, I find that the USPTO, and it's probably good, at, it's probably to the federal government, is people are pretty good about understanding the need to take time off, you know, adjust your schedule do school events, the usual stuff like doctors and dentist appointments. Um, as long as you're courteous to others and you give notice in advance, so you don't assume that somebody else is going to pick up the slack just because you can't do it, um, I find that it nearly always works out. Okay, well, thank you. Great insight, ladies. Uh, anybody else? Okay. How do you deal with being spoken over? How do you curtail this type of behavior without coming across as aggressive? Joanne, Jackie, and then Irene. You know, I've got to tell you, this um, MS Teams, <laughs> Zoom, <laughs> Blue Jeans, <laughs> and all the other platforms we have now have really helped us uh, with that, with with addressing that, because now you can raise your hand. <laughs> oh, excellent! Okay. You can put your feedback in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, but but on a serious note, um, what I've found is sometimes um, with my style, right? I'm not uh, someone who like uh, pushes myself into the conversation. I want oftentimes I, I, I want to be heard um, and I make certain that whatever it is that I'm saying, it's. We need to listen to what she has to say. <laughs> um, making it important. Um, but I have been in meetings, you know, uh, from time to time throughout my career where you get spoken over or it's like they don't hear you. And what I've done is uh, I, I will wait until the person finishes speaking. Right. And then I will go back and say, um, excuse me, um, I had a point that I wanted to make that I'd like to make certain doesn't get lost on the subject that we were just talking about. And more often than not, when I've made that, provided that feedback, you know, I've gotten a aha, almost like, wow, I'm glad we did, you know, <laughs> hear what she had to say because that's really important, mm -hmm. you know. And then I just stop, you know, I stop right there. I don't drag or belabor it out, but I do think it's important that you can just say, 
you know, excuse me, wait until they finish. Don't feel like you're being shut out. Get your feelings caught up. Um, but do make certain that you uh, speak up. You know, you can always say excuse me and, and you can raise your hand <laughs> physically, you know, if you need to. I've done that too. You know, hey, I have something that I'd like to say. And uh, folk appreciate that. They really do appreciate it. And I found that that always, uh, almost always when I've done that, it's been well received. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Jackie? So I think this is a tough one. And frankly, I think it can be tough in a virtual environment too, which we've all been doing for the last two years. Um, and I think sometimes, especially in groups of five or more, which is often the case in my meetings, and especially if you're around people like to talk a lot, which we all are, uh, <laughs> there can be a danger of not being heard at all if you aren't at least a little aggressive, which sort of goes up to Joanne's point. The trick, of course, is to do it with finesse without being overbearing, um, and it's an art form. I mean, and it's not always easy to master. Um, you know, sometimes, and Joanne pointed out, sometimes you can raise your hand, either virtually or actually in person, and I think that can be effective especially if the group is really big. Um, and if the person is, is, who's running the meeting is paying attention, I think that can be really effective. I think with smaller or mid-side groups, like five to 10 people, which is the kind of meetings I have a lot, this kind of thing can fall to the wayside. Like even if some people raise their hands, some people just plow on. Um, so it, you know, it's the smaller the group, the less I think the raising hands <laughs> necessarily works, even though you try it. Um, regarding being spoken over, I mean, and goes, I'm just going to reiterate what Joanne said. Sometimes you just have to say something indicating that you'd like to speak at some point. You know, it kind of depends on what's happening. I think a lot of times the speak over, if you will, by others, it's intentional. And so it pays to be patient and let that person finish and then pipe in as soon as you can. Um, if it looks like somebody really is cutting you off inappropriately, that can be easier or harder to handle depending on the situation. I mean, if they're really, you know, being a butt, you can feel okay to say, look, I'm gonna cut in now and I'm gonna say what I have to say. Um, you know, don't be afraid to speak up. Um, and then there's the, another thing I point out, if you're in virtual meetings, there's the IM chat. There have been times when I haven't been able to say what I wanted to say, so finally I just typed it in the IM chat. And then somebody said, oh, Jackie just wrote blah, blah, blah. And then we ended up talking about that. So that, that can be really helpful. And then the last thing I would say is, if you work with somebody who speaks over you all the time um, and you really see a pattern, I think it's worth having a private conversation with them later. Um, because in my experience, people like that are completely oblivious and they have no intention of cutting you off or preventing you from speaking. Um, they're just excited about the topic or they have really strong views. Um, and if that's the case, which is almost always the case, I, I think that person might really appreciate hearing from you, sort of going to what Joanne said. I think if you just tell them privately, you say, hey, you know, I really couldn't get it in edge in edwise, ed, you know, edge in edwise. And it was, it, I find it difficult to talk when you're talking. I think if you tell somebody that, they'll become aware and they'll probably be more careful next time. It's, I think it's actually good feedback for them. But of course, you want to do it in private and not embarrass them. Um, that's probably more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Irene? I agree uh, with what both ladies stated. I'll just give you an example of what happened to me a couple of years ago. I was in a small group meeting, um, spot like six people, and I was stating a case and it was a controversial case, but there was a person that was a senior to me who physically turned his body to me and put his hand right in front of my face to have me stop talking. <laughs> and um, and I just turned to him and I literally took a deep breath. I actually said his name out loud and said, stop and put your hand down. And what I realized was at that moment, when you say someone's first name as the primary method to stop the conversation, they, they react. It's not like, uh, you know, will you stop? It's saying Steve, right? It, it stops that conversation right then and there. Um, so my advice is that what I have used is using that first name tactic and use that as the first statement you make and then make whatever statement you want after that. But A, it catches the attention, not of them, but everyone else. And sometimes you have to do that. So there are other times I agree you can have that private conversation. There are other times that you can be more, you can be softer but I will tell you that there are times when you have to call it out and 
when I have, I use the first name technique. And that has worked for me. Um, something I do with my own daughter, right? Like Natasha and then, right? But it gets, it gets their attention. So maybe it's a mother thing, I don't know. But that's just some advice from my perspective of what I've looked for. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anybody else? Okay. I think that first name thing is excellent. I, I hadn't thought about that. And you're absolutely right. That does sort of stop it. That's, that's great. I'm going to keep that in mind. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, do you take mental health days? Is, it, is that encouraged, Janine? You know, I, I don't, um, but I, I should. I would say that I take my uh, you know, leave time uh, and sick leave time, and I definitely encourage uh, other people to take the days off because I want I want my colleagues to be energized and, and, and happy and raring to go. <laughs> but I think I have to, on this, I, I might have to work a little bit more on it. <laughs> okay. Yes, work on it, Janine. Um, anybody else? All right. Um, I don't, um, if I may add, I don't take mental health days, but as our mental health is being uh, just expanded so much and our resilience is being stretched so much, my personal backdrop says, let's breathe. OK, so that is to remind me to take that mental health time, check your mental health temperature. And so you don't have to always take the mental health day because as we're all here career women and that that's hard to do for the whole day but to check in and to even ask other people to check you to because you may sound a little bit too harsh and you may need to go back and say because we get burnout and we don't realize it so you may need to ask someone uh i need i need a self check and that's from an opposite instead of just looking in the mirror so just to add that Thank you. Now, I just wanted to add, um, if the audience has any questions, if they could please put, the, put it in the chat. Um, I'm going to leave like a few minutes to get to one or two questions. And who was going to monitor that? Is that um, Johanna and Rachel? Crystal and I, or Johanna and I will monitor. Okay. <clears throat> we, did okay. have, we did have a question about working, children, multitasking, our careers, that type of question. How do you juggle working children, advancing your career all at the same time? So I think that was similar to the one about having children, having babies. Um, did anybody want to just recap that? I think the one thing I would say is that it definitely takes a village. Uh, I mean, when you're trying, you know, if you have friends who are in similar boats, you can do, you know, how you figure out with childcare. It really does help if you have a partner. Uh, my husband is actually incredibly supportive, and I won't lie to you, a big part of the reason why I was able to do what I did is because I had a supportive husband. I know that not everybody has necessarily a supportive person. You might have a parent or anybody, you know, any, anybody that can be sort of a village for you. Um, I think that that is really helpful to help manage all of those things. And then the other thing is to realize you will feel overwhelmed and you will have days where you feel like you just can't do it all. And sometimes at that point, you just need to go to bed. But you just go to bed and, and in the morning, it'll seem better. Because <laughs> just the whole thing of like just, just doing the best you can and gutting it out and making it happen, it will get easier later, sooner or later. Okay, I do want to get this question in because we are coming up short on time. But how do you overcome having ideas that you come up with taken for credit by others? Irene and then Judy. I call it out. I am relatively outspoken. Um, and sometimes I'll just be like, oh, I'm glad you agree with me. Uh, right. Uh, but uh, but I'm pretty good about being like, oh, I, you know, did I not articulate that clearly? Uh, but you have to make it known. So that's that's what I've done. Um, I don't know how successful that's been, but I, I am a little bit more aggressive. And I think that's just due to the time in the job that's required me to be that way. And I hope in 10 years from now, we won't have to be as assertive or I don't have to be as assertive because people won't do that. But right now that's my tact. 
I agree wholeheartedly. Just make it known. I, I've had it happen a couple of times. It's very awkward and weird and, you know, it does make it seem like, you know, you weren't clear or maybe you weren't good enough to actually execute the idea that you had. But I think making it known um, that you, that was your idea, you know, just be vocal about it. Don't go to sleep on it and let it, you know, pass by, make it known. Okay. So we have a question in the chat that says we talk a lot about moms being professionals a lot, but but what advice do you have for single people who who are thought that their time is more flexible? I thought I would answer that just just I, I obviously I'm not a single mom, but I realized as I was talking that I was talking about the advantages of not being a single mom. But I will tell you that um, I. I there are times when my husband has traveled and things like that. So I, I have a little bit of a taste of it. And I, and I will say that I think other moms um, are, can be a tremendous asset. Um, you can talk to people, you can, you know, the, you'd be surprised how often somebody is available to like take your kid from here to there. Um, I've just, I've just seen so many people be super supportive. Um, and so I, it, it's the whole create a village. I mean, it really does take a village to do all of our stuff. And so create your village in whatever way that looks and it doesn't matter. Um, so, oh, oh, I just realized there's an update to that to clarify about people who don't have kids. Um, and that's actually a really good question, too, because I know that a lot of people who don't have children feel like they pick up the slack for people who do. Um, and I think that that's just something to make sure that people are aware. I think I, as a, as a, as a per parent with children, I am cognitive of that, and I think that's profoundly unfair. Um, and people have different things in your life, and you don't know what's going on with them. So there, it's, that's something to make sure that um, that everybody knows and to talk about it as a group if need be. Okay, thank you. So, so Laverne, Laverne yes. I'll, I'll also add to that, I, and I think it goes back to the uh, point that we were making earlier around balance, mm -hmm. right? People have to know that you have balance in your life, right? That work is not your entire life. You love work, right? You love what you do, but you also have balance. And uh, the other piece that fed into that was um, the boundaries. You know, earlier we talked about establishing boundaries. And so I think that it's a matter of setting up a cadence, if you will, with those who you really enjoy engaging with as well as your colleagues. <laughs> so they know, oh, you know what? She has to go because she knows she does this, 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 and this, and you know, she's gotta be out of here. But um, but 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 I do think it's important just to share, you know, just share with folks so they know, you know, that work is just not your whole life. You do have work life balance. Exactly. Well, and ladies, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Rachel. Go ahead. And with that said, I think you were leading to what I was thinking. Laverne, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, um, unfortunately, we are coming close to time for us to be over. Um, so. I am going to just at this time, thank you so very much for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. Um, I'm sure there were many aha moments. I can see them coming through on the chat. Um, this has been great. And uh, I'd love to do a part two, but you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce Eloise Parker, who is our executive champion uh, for Census Women Count, and she will provide some insightful remarks. Uh, Eloise. So this is Lisa Paulson. Um, I've been chatting with Eloise. She's actually at headquarters in Suitland where there's a storm going on and she mm -hmm. was concerned that that might affect her. She might have dropped off. <laughs> um, I saw her okay. just disappear as you were introducing her. So it may, just may be oh. the storm that's happening in Suitland right now. So um, okay. I know that she was very very appreciative. There's oh, here Eloise. she is. She's yeah. back. There she is. There she is. She's back. Yeah. Oh, I, <laughs> oh my goodness, you all. I, I was just saying to Lisa, the lights just flickered and my computer shut out and I'm like, oh my goodness, what terrible timing. <laughs> anyway, I apologize, Rachel. Did you all? No um, worries. Go ahead. Our... It's your time. It's your time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Listen, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Rachel, to uh, Laverne, um, to Judy. Those are my special Census Bureau peeps. But for all of you, that was a fantastic panel. Um, 
And uh, I, I, uh, you know, I today's the last day of Women's History Month, and and it was just a really fantastic way to close out the month. Um, I want to, uh, I, I, I truly believe that the reason the theme for this year's Women's History Month was around the pandemic, and absolutely, the pandemic has introduced a level of stress and change and uncertainty that most of us have never experienced in our lives and hopefully will not. And I could see in the chat as you all were talking how, you know, the level of loss that people have experienced either directly from COVID or all of sort of the corollary like impacts and stresses and mental health challenges that people have had in this, in this time. But what I really want to say is that Women have been balancing their personal and professional lives long before March of 2020. <laughs> and at our core, we've always been mothers to our daughters and sons and daughters to our aging parents and supportive partners to our loved ones, grandparents helping our children raise their children. And every day between the cracks, we're still moving the needle in our workplace here at the Department of Commerce. Um, you guys are amazing women and and demonstrating that providing hope and healing as the theme are forever. It's a pandemic. Um, so I, I from from myself as sort of the the proud advocate for census women's counts um, for a fantastic exec board and membership. Um, I want to say thank you. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't make a pitch to become a member of your agency's chapter of Federally Employed Women. It's a great organization. It's a great way to foster community and, and uh, you know, advocate for women in, in the workplace. So I hope you also have gotten inspiration out of this event. And um, thank you all so, so much. And sorry for the, uh, you know, I'm now was, on a very tenuous right hot time, spot. <laughs> We thank you. We thank everyone for joining today for our Women's History Month special observance event. We appreciate and we thank you, thank you, thank you, all the participants. From the bottom of our hearts, um, the Department of Commerce, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Minority Business Development Agency, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, I had to have this written down, and the Census Bureau. You know, we, before we end, we will show the spotlight video again. It includes women across all of our cross-agency. Uh, we are spotlighting uh, a lot of the women from out of the agencies, and we were so happy to put this together. The, the planners, the folks from PIO, Lisa Paulson, I have to call your name out. And I know I'm not supposed to do that, but that's okay. You were fantastic. You and your team, Crystal and Michelle, you guys rocked. And you kept us on task. And the folks that did the videos for the uh, director, we are just so, so uh, happy that you all came on and we partnered together as a team. Laverne, you rock. And Johanna, you behind the scenes, girl, you back there doing your thing. So today's session has been recorded. We would like for you to just visit few.org. If you'd like to join, we would love to have you as a, as a member. And uh, we hope that you have a great afternoon. The video will start rolling. Thank you. Thanks all. Guys, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you so much.
team says kudos. 